Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for our webcast, Coding and Creativity. Today's event is presented by Little Bits. My name is Kanoi Namahoy. I'm the editor for Smart Brief on EdTech, and I'm very happy to be here to moderate this discussion. We've got a great speaker lineup for you today, folks. First up is Chris Kunkel. Chris is the STEM coordinator and middle school math teacher at Hoboken Charter School. Before coming to HCS, Chris taught math in Camden, New Jersey through, for, through the Teach for America program. As STEM coordinator, Chris leads the robotics team, Girls Who Code Club, Destination Imagination Team, and Math Team, among other clubs and classes. Next, we have Kelly Knight, STEAM coordinator at Riverside Presbyterian Day School in Jacksonville, Florida. Kelly runs a makerspace classroom where students in grades K through 6 get to participate in STEAM-themed projects. In her classroom, Kelly's students work with a variety of tools and technologies and learn basic design and engineering principles, as well as circuitry, coding, robotics, and 3D printing and design. And finally, we have Liza Starks, Senior Manager of Learning and Engagement at Little Bits. Liza is a designer, playmaker, and educator based in New York. She creates game-like learning experiences sculpts circuits out of fabric and paper, and works hand-in-hand -hand with communities to make epic things. Before we launch into the main presentation, I need to go over just a few brief housekeeping items, folks. Uh, first, this webcast will be about an hour long, and we are recording it. We will email you a link to the archived recording so you can view the presentation again later if you'd like, or share it with a colleague. Please disable your pop-up blockers to ensure you have no trouble viewing the slides or links in today's presentation. Our event will include some brief video clips. If you run into any technical difficulties with them or anything else, go ahead and just click on Control F5 to refresh your screen. If that doesn't work, go ahead and reach out to us using the Q&A box. Uh, we will do a live Q&A with our speakers at the end of the presentation. Feel free to submit your questions to them using the chat box on your screen. If you need to adjust the size of your slides, you can do so by dragging the corner of the box. We encourage you to visit the Resource Center located on your console so you can access a number of very helpful resources. And finally, at the end of this event, we will present you with a survey. Please take a few minutes to fill this out and let us know your thoughts on today's event. And now on to our main presentation. Liza, it's all yours. Hi, everybody. I hope you're doing well today. Um, so. I want to talk about games and coding. Um, so let's, to get started, we'll just go over what I'm going to talk about uh, briefly. So first we're going to discuss the main, the current situation, how things stand right now in schools and, and after schools with coding. Um, I'm going to give you an introduction to a little bit. Then we're going to talk about making and coding in the classroom. And then finally, we're going to talk about the Little Bits Code Kit and tips for bringing coding to your classroom or library. So let's set the context, right? We, we live in the 21st century. We live with a bunch of students who are completely fluent with their smartphones, with screen technology. So they're using it, but they're not understanding how it works, right? And then also you have this really, really high barrier to entry, or at least perceived barrier to entry, of what coding is and how people can get into it because there are all of these preconceptions that coding is only for people who are math people and only for science people. Um, and then also you have girls, students of color, low-income students who it has been documented have persistent achievement gaps in STEM subjects. Um, not to mention that all bunch of coding languages platforms are constantly changing. And all of this is sort of looking into the future as we think about tomorrow and where our students are going to be um, and what's going to be required them for success. So the mission of Little Bits really starts from this situation, and it's about getting everybody, empowering everyone to create inventions, large or small, with the, our platform of easy-to-use electronic building blocks. We have over 70 modules. It's a library, essentially. It's a library of different bits. Each module has a different function. And if you're not familiar with how Little Bits works, I'm going to walk you through it right now. 
So each bit has a specific color associated with it, and as I said before, a specific function. So you have your blue power bit, that's what gives energy, electricity to your circuit. You have your pink input bit, so you can change how bright an LED gets or how fast a motor moves. And there are many different types of these pink bits. They can measure temperature, they can, uh, they're buttons, um, many different kinds. Then you have orange, which is wire. And finally, you have green, which is output. So lights, uh, sound, speakers, and motors. Um, the order is important. Um, you want to have your pink before your green. And they also snap together with magnets, so you, you, can't, um, you can't get it wrong. So thinking about all of these different um, all of these different bits, you can combine them in so many different ways that it really allows you thousands of options for how to create different inventions, to create different in circuit, different circuits, and then with the incorporation of outside materials, these circuits become inventions. Right? Kids are creating things that they see every day. They're creating flashlights, but then they're also creating uh, glow worms. They're creating um, alarms, they're creating um, story dioramas. And Little Bits is not just, it's not just, it's sort of a, a tool unto itself. Um, we are a growing ecosystem. We are always partnering with other organizations and companies um, to really expand what's possible with Little Bits. Little bits is also something that grows with you, so it's it's not just for an expert. Um, it's it's really for uh, for students of all ages, right? It um, you can start very very low. You can start at a beginner level and gradually work your way up, even until you're able to build your own bit. So the learning pathway is it's very scaffolded, and and there's a lot of room to explore. It also works across the curriculum. So, you know, you may think that uh, you hear circuits and it's science. Um, but indeed, we've seen so many teachers and so many examples of, um, of classrooms and learning spaces that are using these, uh, that are using little bits to connect science to art or connect history to math. Um, they also align to many state and national standards. Uh, such as Common Core, uh, Next Generation Science Standards, and some of the new computer science standards. So you have you have high ceilings, and then you have very wide walls as well with little bits. So that's where we were. That's where we are. That that is little bits. And I want to talk to you now about where we're going because we are we are so excited about where things are headed for for us and for you in the future. So I'm not going to read this quotation for you guys. Um, I, you can read it yourselves. But as you're looking at it, I, I want to tell you that we take play very seriously at Little Pits. Um, for us, we don't consider play this idea of chocolate-covered broccoli, that play or games are just something that you, you, you put in your classroom as a means towards engagement. That's not how we feel. We, we feel very strongly and believe strongly that play is an intrinsically important part of learning. That through this process, the process of play, kids have the opportunity to take on new roles, take risks, um, get feedback quickly. It's sort of this magic circle of learning that's created. Um, and that is what we are trying to design for. Um, not necessarily, again, this, this idea of chocolate-covered broccoli with games. So we know that right now, when, you, when students have a sense of, of confidence, um, it's a game changer for them, no pun intended. Um, we also know that uh, students having a sense of self-efficacy that emerges from this confidence is really linked to self-expression. Um, so when you have opportunities for students to express themselves through technology, to connect it to their, to their interests, to make it relevant to the real world, um, that's where 
that's where this becomes a really powerful learning opportunity. And this was our starting point when we started to develop the Little Bits Coding Kit, the Little Bits Code Kit, excuse me. Um, so through the Little Bits Code Kit, you build games and learn to code. So this is where I think um, it gets magical because it's not just about learning to code through the screen. It's really about getting hands-on with the bits and being able to see the impact of the things that you're doing on the screen in real life. Not only that, you're learning how to design games, you're learning about the process of designing games um, as you're also working within the coding environment and building circuits on your own. Um, in addition, so with the code kit, we have new bits that we are very excited about. We have the little bits code bit. Um, we also have an LED matrix and a rechargeable battery. The kit comes with four inventions. Um, so the first invention you'll see on the left is a tug of war. And then you have an ultimate shootout, a hot potato, and a key tar. And each of these inventions is associated with a particular coding concept that will allow students to explore that concept deeply. Um, and then remix their inventions, change their inventions um, based on ideas that they have of their own as evidence of their learning. We also have one of the things that we have done in this kit that we have taken learnings from the past and put them into this kit is um, more resources, more resources to really support students and teachers. So we want you to be successful so your students can be successful. So that means tutorials that are student facing, um, videos, small exercises for them to get them up and running with harder concepts quickly. Uh, this is the app. So the app is also, all of these tutorials are embedded in the app. Um, you'll see it, it looks, uh, it's, um, excuse me, uh, drag and drop programming. Um, it's actually built on top of Blockly, which is a programming language developed by Google. And finally, resources. So we've created tons of resources for, for teachers to implement and to adapt to fit inside of their learning space. So lessons, activities, again, tutorials, classroom management tips, assessment tools, um, certificates, and to do this, we actually have, we have brought on educators at various points in our process um, to work with. So we've had an advisory board come on and work with us throughout the entire process um, to design and develop the kit. And most recently, we're excited to announce um, the, the newest program at Little Bits uh, in the Little Bits Education Department called the Little Bits Lead Educators. And the lead educators are 17 uh, teachers, librarians, um, STEAM coordinators from across the country who will be working with Little Bits over the next six to seven weeks to develop a, an extended library of resources. And actually, Kelly and Chris, who you'll hear from later, are a part of that first cohort. We are very, very excited to have them. So. Now, before, before I move on and pass this off to, to Kelly and Chris, I want to set a little bit of a context of some tips and tricks when you're thinking about bringing coding to your school through little bits or otherwise. So the first thing to do to remember is to always start with activities that have a low barrier to entry. It's really, really important when students are faced with, uh, with concepts they may have preconceptions about. They may, again, not think that they are those math people or those science people. You want to get them engaged quickly and you want to get them feeling successful as soon as possible. Tip number two, it is, it is completely okay to learn alongside your students. If you have never, if you have never worked with code before, you've never programmed before, that's totally fine. In fact, it's really empowering for your students if you sit down with them and say, I don't know. And I know it's scary to think about, but it's very, very powerful to see your students be able to, to grow and to understand that even as adults, there are still some things that we don't know. Um, so really good way to, to reinforce the idea of lifelong learning. 
Tip number three, connect with other faculty. Right? So if you're, if you're a classroom teacher, go talk to your librarian, for example. They're great resources. Or maybe you want your uh, science teacher and you want to work with an English teacher um, around coding or a math teacher, sort of bringing more narrative into, into some of these processes. Tip number four, uh, understand your school's IT process. This is, this is probably maybe even tip number one. Um, have a very good idea. Go talk to your tech director before you do anything, because if you're if you need to download an app, if it's not uh, if you know it's it's not on the Chrome store, if you don't use Chromebooks, um, and if your IT department requires a significant lead time beforehand, make sure you do it ahead. Make sure you download anything ahead, and keep them in the loop of, of what's, uh, what you're doing in your classroom. Tip number five, make it creative and relevant. Make it relevant to your students' lives. Um, bring in their stories, ask them questions. Um, make it feel connected to their interests. Um, and this is really you know, where you have an opportunity to even co-design with your own students. Um, talk about what they want to learn. Talk about, um, you know, what what they want to bring into it, what what their goals are, and and start from there. And I think the most important tip, period, is to have fun. It is even though if you've never coded before, it sometimes it can feel it can feel very scary. But once you do it, you might once you start, you might actually find yourself sitting at the computer hunting around for puzzles. And that's because coding is all about problem finding. Yes, you are going to be solving problems, but it's even better to, to understand how to find them. Um, so have fun and be curious and, and express yourself. That's what creativity and coding is about. So thank you so much for listening. I'm going to go ahead and pass this on to Chris. Chris, take it away. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chris Kunkel. I am the middle school math teacher and STEM coordinator for Hoboken Charter School. Just a tiny little bit about myself before we get in. Um, I spend most of my day teaching uh, math. And as STEM coordinator, though, I am responsible for bringing in um, interesting STEM programs, including coding, which is why I am here to speak with you today. Um, a brief agenda for my session. I'm going to talk about how I personally got started in coding, um, some ways you can invest students in your coding program, and finally, some example projects. Um, so let me just say before I show you some things that I am not a computer scientist. Um, I was a math major before being a math teacher. So uh, I can tell you, as somebody who had very little coding experience before I started trying to teach students coding, that it's perfectly doable. It's actually quite a bit of fun. Um, so how I actually began, about four years ago, the vice principal at my school said to me, um, hey, look, coding is the thing of the future. Uh, why don't you look into doing some kind of coding thing with our students? Um, we are a very small school. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of resources to be hiring computer science teachers. So it, it falls on us as educators to bring in these opportunities. So um, we all take on extra responsibilities. Um, so because of that, uh, we have these elective classes that we run. And I thought an elective class is a great way to start coding. So with some of my fifth and sixth graders, we jumped right in and we did MIT's App Inventor. Um, I was looking around. There are many, many, many resources online. And out of all those, I chose this one because it allows students to code apps that they can actually run on phones if they have an Android phone. Um, they also have an on-screen app emulator. So if they don't have an Android phone, they can run it on the computer directly. It looked like a really engaging way to get started. But the thing was, like I said, I had no experience doing coding before um, actually beginning this thing. And the vice principal told me about two or three weeks before the elective class was scheduled to start that it would be a good idea. So I had very little lead time. So I was actually learning alongside of the students. And what you will find is that many of the online resources helpfully have tutorials and getting started pages. So what I did with the students were we went through these tutorials together and we learned all about um, how App Inventor worked. We coded some apps. I would say it was a pretty good way to get started, but it was definitely wasn't the perfect design. Um, and I took away a couple of lessons. 
Um, I, one, it's perfectly fine to jump right in. Uh, students um, are great with learning this stuff. Um, just jump right in there with them. Um, and tutorials are a great way to get started. Uh, I wish I would have spent just a little more time um, learning about the program because App Inventor is great, but there are some user interface issues that we um, faced along the way. Uh, the, the app is a little buggy at times. Sometimes it wouldn't load what the students were asked to do. Um, but overall, it was a good start. My big takeaway from this is that students need to learn, have a reason to code. And what I mean by that is um, tutorials were a great start, but tutorials alone um, were not enough for sustained interest. What I was finding was we had a great start to the, the, the elective class, but as the elective class moved forward, um, the kids were getting a little bored with tutorials. They needed to have more of a reason to code other than we're learning to work App Inventor. Moving a little bit further into the future, my next experience with coding was an after-school club. So like I said, I did App Inventor with fifth and sixth graders. That was probably actually a little young. I think it'd be more suited for seventh and up. Um, but in my after-school club, I was gonna have some students as young as third grade. So App Inventor definitely wasn't something I wanted to repeat. So I kept looking for other coding opportunities. Um, and I came across Scratch. Scratch is probably one of the best known um, beginner program um, programming opportunities. Um, and it is really good for beginners. It had very, very few user interface issues. Students can get right into it and can do some very basic things and all the way up to some very, very complicated things. If you go to the Scratch website, you will see some amazing programs that um, students have created. Um, as I said, I decided, you know, tutorials, Scratch has some great ones, but they just aren't enough for sustained interest. So my second shot at it was, well, let's issue some challenges. Let's give the students some reasons to code. So again, went online and I searched around and I found that someone had handily created a um, list of Scratch challenges that ranged from basic up until rather complicated. So what I did was I printed these challenges out and I gave them to the students and I said, look, let's, let's work through these. And along the way, um, each one you get, you get a little sticker and see how far you can get during the term. And what I learned from this was that some students will be very into coding where others, sorry, there we go. Some students will be very into coding and will find it really fun but other students um, will get a little frustrated along the way and become potential you know, behavior problems. So I think it's uh, moving on to Scratch was definitely a step in the right direction, but we still didn't have it right yet. Um, the students who were into it were really into it, and then there were some students that weren't so into it. And that led me to my third iteration of doing a coding program, and I think this is when I finally started to get it right. And that was when we joined up with uh, Girls Who Code. Girls Who Code is a national nonprofit organization that, um, that is dedicated to closing the gender gap in the technology field. And what they do is you apply in, um, if you're accepted, what they do is they pair you with a, um, a tech professional. So somebody who does coding for a living comes in and helps you teach your students. It's an after-school club, and so it pairs an educator, somebody who knows how to work with students, with somebody who's in the tech field, who knows the technology, and together you teach, um, you teach the class how to code. And what's really great about Girls Who Code, and it's not a platform, it's a community. The students in the club really learn to want to be there because um, they are part of this group of students who are all working together to learn the same stuff. They're all learning coding, whether it be Scratch, whether it be something much more complicated like JavaScript or HTML. They're all there for the same reason. And developing that sense of community is what I think is really important when you want to develop a coding program with sustained interest. Um, just an example, last year some of our students were invited to go to a graduation event um, and while at this event the founder of Girls Who Code was tweeting out about their projects and one of the projects was then written up in the Huffington Post and you can't imagine how like excited these students were that their projects were being featured and that were being celebrated outside of our little community here at Hoboken Charter School. And that is like the big takeaway that from all of this. You have the most success when you have your students invested. And the way you invest students is by finding ways of celebrating with the students, whether that be at a graduation event or many, many other things. Get students on board, um, get them naturally in, um, interested, and they'll want to code.
And there's many ways you can do that, and that's what we're going to move into now, um, some examples of coding programs that have high investment factors. One of them, and this is one of my favorites, is First Lego League, and this is one of a number of different robotics um, leagues that all go together. Um, in this competition, students are challenged using a Lego Mindstorm programming, um, Lego Mindstorm kit and some programming to build a robot that can complete missions on a table. And what you can see in the picture there is the table is basically um, a four foot by eight foot sheet of plywood with a mat and some Lego pieces on it. Each year, new challenges are issued and the students have to program the robot to earn points. They, uh, the robot has two and a half minutes to move about the board and do different missions and they try to get as many points as possible and they compete with other schools in your area. The thing is though, the students can only touch the robot when it's in a small area. Um, you can see that there is a quarter circle in the corner of the table there. That's the only part um, of the table where the students are allowed to touch the robot. Once the robot leaves that area, it needs to be fully autonomous. So before the competition date, the students need to spend hours and hours and hours coding the robot to do these missions. Um, there's some strategy involved. It's, it's a game, but it's coding. Um, I'm now going to show a brief video of the robot um, at our tournament last year doing a mission or two just to give you an idea of what that looks like. Kind of like what I hope you could see from that video is it's like um, it's like a sports event almost, except what the sport that students are doing involved loads and loads of coding. Um, another competition event that we had a lot of success with that the girls in our Girls Who Code Club got very invested in was called Project CS Girls. In this competition, students are challenged to design a technological solution to some kind of world problem. What they chose to do was use an Arduino kit to um, sense whether or not garbage being put into a um, can should be recycled. Um, the actual details aren't what's important, but what's important is that the girls had a reason to do some coding. They decided they wanted to do this project, they had to learn all about how Arduino works, and then learn some circuitry along the way. Another great robotics program, and this is more for younger students, is called Make Wonder. Um, in this robotics program, um, the robots come pre-built. Um, in FLL, the students have to build the robots themselves. In Make Wonder, the students get robots that are pre-built, but instead have to code them to do various missions. Um, the programming is a little bit easier. It's done on a tablet. Students drag and drop um, different blocks around and sequence them using kind of like a wire system to get the robot to do things in a certain order. In the next video, I'm going to show you a few of our students who completed one of the missions for the competition last year. Um, also, before I show that, what's nice about this particular competition is that you don't have to go anywhere. It's all videotaped ahead of time, and you submit videos of your students' solutions to the various challenges. So this is the video um, that some of our students did to complete one of the missions from the tournament. Two, one. Those are just a few of the competitions that I entered my students in. These are, on the screen, are some examples of other ones. There are tons and tons and tons of these things. If you search up um, competition, academic competitions, you can find many of them. And what I really like about them is it really gives students a way, um, a reason to do what they're doing. It's more than just coming to learn about the program. They have a reason for wanting to learn. What I will say is some of them have a startup cost, like First Lego League. Um, the first year you do it, you have to invest in all the robotics pieces. Um, but other ones, like the Project CS Girls or the Verizon Innovative App Challenge, have very, very small startup costs. So you can find um, a myriad of different things that you can do with your students. 
Now, moving beyond competitions, another great way to invest students is through full school events. Um, a very popular one is the Hour of Code. The way we did Hour of Code at Hoboken Charter School last year was our Girls Who Code students, who are grades 6 through 8, invited younger students, grades 3 through 5, to attend um, an event after school. At this event, um, the older students decided to uh, like pick some um, Hour of Code events, and if you search Hour of Code, you will find many, many, many um, events, uh, activities you can do with students. The older students searched around and they found ones that they thought would be good and appropri age appropriate for the students that were coming, and the older students acted as the teachers for the younger students. Um, it was a great way to invest students because the older kids really loved getting to be the teachers and the younger kids really loved getting to hang out and learn from the older students. We did that as an after-school program, but you can also do it during the school day. Some of our students pushed into the even younger grades, first and second grade, and did the same thing, basically acted as teachers for the day um, to do a little coding lesson. It's a great way to get students on board um, and give them a reason to want to do what they do. Another all-school event that you can do is a share day. So we did this with Girls Who Code, but it doesn't have to be with a girl-only program. Um, what you do is at the end of a term or a semester, however you sequence your events, you have a day where you invite parents and other teachers and community members to come in and show off what the kids uh, do with um, their coding. So at the end of last year, uh, we had our Girls Who Code Club do a share day. Um, it was totally student-led. Um, parents came in and got to see all the stuff throughout the year. Again, it gives students a reason to want to do what they do um, by having that little ultimate event that they're planning for. Another idea, and this one I haven't actually done yet, but it's, I think, a great idea, is to host a school-wide or grade-level-wide or however you want to do it, but it's called a hackathon or a codeathon. At this kind of event, it's basically taking a whole, like the idea of a share day, except compacting it into a two to four hour event. So at the beginning of the event, and students don't know this ahead of time, you'll issue them some challenges. Um, it could be something simple like create a program about animals, or it could be much more complicated. Uh, you can design it to your own liking, but you give students a challenge and then they have a limit of time for how long um, they can work on the coding. And then at the end, they share. You can give out prizes for the ones that are most creative, or you can just have a share. But basically, you compact a whole lot of coding into a small amount of time and make it um, like a competitive environment. And I think my final thing I'm going to speak about, and this is um, project ideas, would be to do a computer science impact project. For a computer science impact project, what that is, is basically, this is an idea I got from Girls Who Code, by the way. This is a project where students, um, where students have, um, like they want to code a project, but rather than it just being anything, they code a project around, uh, 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 I lost the word, they code a project around that has like an impact on their community or um, anything. And the students then share this, um, and I'm going to play a video of two of our students, and these are the ones that were written up in the Huffington Post, talking about their CF impact project. So our project is Get the Let Out. It's a website, but recently we've been making a game on Scratch. So basically, it puts you in a scenario of you living in Flint, Michigan, and you have to answer different questions. Like, if you were making food, would you use tap water or bottled water? And you just basically have to get the question this way. Yeah, so, uh, we used a lot of different types of code while making our website and the game. We used HTML, Scratch for the game, JavaScript, and CSS. And um, we wanted to make our website and game to teach students about the dangers of lead poisoning and the Flint, Michigan water crisis. This is our game. Yeah. And click the start button. Basically, and you how can read. the game works. It teaches you how it works, and then it kind of introduces it, and you do daily tasks. So first one is that you have to make oatmeal for breakfast, and it asks you whether you want to use tap water or bottled water. Water. Mm. And, and the correct question would be tap water. Yeah. And bottled water. Bottled water. And you kind of just have to answer. And then you, do, you go on to the next one, and it's all again bottled water, and then that's... That's... A, that's... That's... that's, that's
Okay, thanks everyone. That is um, the end of my presentation. I'm going to hand it over to Kelly. Okay, hello. Uh, well, first of all, my name is Kelly Knight. I'm currently in my second year of being the STEAM coordinator at Riverside Presbyterian Day School in beautiful Jacksonville, Florida. Um, I have my contact information here, so please con feel free to contact me after this. Um, so above is a picture of my awesome classroom. Recently, we did a fundraiser and they um, raised money so I could make a true maker space. I have these tables I can fit into different shapes, um, chairs that move around, lots of storage, a Lego wall, 3D printer. Um, I facilitate the maker space at our school and students um, from grades kindergarten through sixth grade come to me on a weekly basis. Um, I'm one of the multiple resources resources in my school. So they go to music, art, piece, Spanish, et cetera, and then also STEAM. Um, STEAM, we realize, is a more general philosophy, and it permeates into different aspects of the students' lives here at school, but their time in my classroom is just additional STEAM enrichment. So I'm um, constantly working towards ways to integrate STEAM um, with other subject areas and trying to pull other teachers on board. And like I said, this is still my second year, so I'm still working on that aspect. Um, in my room, we're going to be focused on creative, creating and problem solving, group work and design thinking and programming. But today, obviously, I'm going to talk about um, how I've implemented coding creativity and the different tools that I find to be successful in this elementary setting. Although many of the tools I use build on themselves, so really they could be beneficial um, for learning code from preschool all the way to adulthood. <clears throat> so, getting started, that, oh, that's showing up, there we go. Getting started um, is the hardest part. For me, uh, I thought it was funny when Liza was saying about how everyone's an uh, inventor with little bits, and it's very true, that was my story. This is a picture of my group's table. I went to an amazing conference called Constructing Modern Knowledge, it's an annual conference in Manchester, New Hampshire. Um, I was an English major in college, and now here I am giving a talk about coding. So um, that's just proof that anyone can do this. Um, I was a science teacher before I became a STEAM teacher, and I got hired at my school. They had just started a STEAM program um, one year before I joined in, and my administration sent me here to learn uh, about the ideas. So my group sat me down, and as you can see on the table, there's little bits, and they said, you know, play, figure it out. And I was so intimidated. I was one of those people that thought this stuff was just for math people. And so I saw these robots and the circuits and wires and code happening, and I didn't know where to start if I was even comp like capable of comprehending it. Um, but after a while, and I got over myself, I after a few failed attempts in the magnet pushing and resisting, I finally made that first connection, um, which led to me making a woodpecker with a head that swiveled back and forth. Um, so I really think that for me, coding and this sort of mindset started with little bits and a woodpecker. So I'm so happy to be doing this today. Um, another thing I want to note, and Liza also mentioned, was um, learning with and through your students. I started rolling out some of these activities with my kids before I knew where they would end up. And like, that's when the fun really started. Um, students, um, sorry, students were making discoveries and learning through doing, and we were learning through teaching each other. And it wasn't all coming from me. And my students were definitely the happiest and still are. They're the happiest when they're in control of their own learning. I'm there for encouragement. I'm there for um, advice. And, but when, then, when they themselves are the responsible ones for figuring out a program or the circuit or the build, the reward of succeeding in teaching um, themselves and each other is what excites them most. So now I'll talk briefly just about the importance of coding, but I'm pretty sure we all get that by now. Um, Today's kindergartners will graduate high school in 2029, so the future is now, the future is real. So um, I think that these, you know, kind of 
benefits of coding are important if you're trying to bring it to your school, kind of drive home that it's, um, it's uh, important. So computational thinking, obviously, but problem solving or problem finding, as Liza said, um, creating that modern literacy. I feel like everyone's going to know code. Um, I'm sorry if you hear music in the background. I'm by the music room and they're going crazy. Anyways, um, <laughs> the collaboration and the innovation and the creativity, they all go hand in hand with coding. So I have pictures here of um, my kids doing all sorts of things and I'll go a little more into the tools later. Getting your school to love coding. Luckily for me, it came from the top down. I had a head of school who um, brought up coding and saw the importance in it. I think if you're a teacher, it's more about um, just getting the time to be able to try something out, like Hour of Code, like Chris mentioned, um, and then you can just show how important it is um, through that. This is a Sphero heart that my third graders coded um, and then took with the the slow shutter photography. Um, <clears throat> okay. Another super important uh, way for coding to happen is to have that passion and to be flexible and to get that support from your school or the parents. Um, I, um, for me, it was intimidating at first, but as soon as I got hooked, it was a dream. And so I think it's finding the people in your school that are passionate, driven, and playful enough to actually follow through with this um, is important to have your team of your support. So some tools that I'm going to go over, little bits, um, Sphero, Kibo, Makey Makey, Lego, We Do, Scratch, Scratch Junior, and Codable. So this is a picture of my first graders playing with little bits. Um, this was actually one of the first days I gave them um, two time to experience them. They were learning about fireworks because they were in China. They do world travels. And so they just simply drew fireworks on a black piece of paper. And then I thought, what if we could make this art really come to life? And so they were playing around with changing the color on their RGB LEDs. Um, I was lucky enough to be selected to test out the STEAM student kit last year. Um, I asked two of my third grade boys to come in after school and they invented this kind of Rube Goldberg style alarm clock where when the lights turned off, um, the marble rolled down and it would make the alarm go off by hitting the sensor at the bottom there. I've dabbled with Lego marble runs, um, trying to incorporate the Lego and the little bits is easy because they have the Lego attachment. Um, so that's the picture above and below you'll see a um, remote controlled limousine as my student named it. Um, he just was freestyling, just playing around. He had followed a tutorial about how to make a basic um, car and then he added to it. So that was fun. Here, um, I do a lot of these just to build the confidence of my kids with little bits. Um, they know how to do crafty stuff. That's what they like. So when I say you can incorporate little bits into these crafts, um, we got an angel here. We got a frog on the bottom right and above there, that's Zeus, the back of Zeus. So to go from frog to Zeus, it's quite the leap. Uh, the possibilities are really endless. So the video I'm going to show you next, it's the first day my first graders saw a little bit. Um, they had already played with different coding platforms like Scratch Junior and we kind of talked about block programming and the idea that little bits are very similar to that. If one thing happens first, that will control what happens next. Um, I love listening to their observations. They're already talking in like if-then variables and um, the connection of cause and effect, which are all important. Um, aspects of coding. So here we go. I know. Then when we turn it on, and 
brown skin. Okay, see? Good. You have to turn it on. Where? Oh, yeah. Come on. You turn it on? Cool. I don't know how to do this. Here. This was just. Okay, so next we have Sphero, which is one of the all-time favorites of all of me and my students. Um, there are these robotic balls that can be programmed in so many different ways, and the corresponding app, um, Lightning Lab, is awesome, and it goes um, from simply drawing a shape with a color that the Sphero will do, um, then into block programming, and then into text. So it's perfect for that progression as the kids age and get better with the tool. Um, let's see, in these pictures at the bottom left, that's my kindergartners actually, um, and they are free driving Sphero, um, but I still had different links that they had to um, successfully get Sphero to start and stop at, as well as changing the color. So just introducing the idea that this ball is controlled through Bluetooth through the app. And then as they grow, um, they'll start block programming. Um, the the right hand side is really cool. Um, it looks like cardboard and trash, but um, they were learning about erosion. And uh, this one little girl made a cliff, and then each and then she programmed the Sphero to go back and forth like a wave would, and repeatedly um, beat on the cliff and the little foam pieces that would fall. Uh, little by little demonstrating erosion. So with that, I uh, show here the phases of matter. We pretended like spheres were water molecules. That's always a lot of fun. Um, and then here we had the Sphero chariot with an Archaeopteryx on it. We were, they were learning about prehistoric animals and science. So as you can tell, I really take a lot from different subject areas. Um, and the video I'm going to show you next is a slow-mo video of my fourth graders coded the Sphero to go through and up um, to create a crater. Okay, so another tool we use is Kibo. Kibo is amazing. It has tangible blocks that the kids can put together and program to make something um, happen. So here, the second graders were learning about community helpers and social studies. And so this group made a teacher. The video clip I'm going to show you, um, I caught the later half of them going through their program and then the kids' reactions and connections to the real world. I do a lot with Makey Makey and Scratch. As Chris mentioned, Scratch is an amazing program. Here, the kids made a digestive system, hooked up Makey Makey, and each touch point would describe um, a certain thing. And here's a video. The esophagus gets this shape like a tube. The, the food goes down the esophagus and goes to the stomach. The stomach is shaped like a bean-shaped bag.
Okay, so I also um, play around with Lego. We do. It's great. Lego is hands-on building, but also the corresponding app. Here we are. They built this that will detect the flower in front of it and then stop. Scratch Junior is amazing. Codable is uh, really easy to get into, and and uh, kids like that. We also participate in Hour of Code, which I suggest <clears throat> you do if you're just starting out. And uh, I think I'm going to end it at that and back to Kanoi. Excellent job. That was a lot of information for you guys to present. You guys all did a great job doing that. Um, and the questions are coming in fast and furious. So let's go ahead and jump over into the Q&A. Kelly, we're going to give you a chance to just uh, rest your voice for a second. We're going to toss the first one out um, to Chris, but I would like for you to chime in at, after he after he answers, Kelly. Um, one of our attendees said, we would like to introduce the idea of coding in regular classrooms. Our faculty, generally speaking, is either not interested or reluctant to embracing these ideas. Any suggestions? Chris, can you start us off here? Um, sure. Uh, I would suggest that you look for like the faculty member who would be more inclined to be the the, the cheerleader of it, and um, get them on board. Because I feel like, at at least from my own experience, that there's definitely some people that are going to be hesitant. But it, it isn't so bad once you get started, and actually can be quite a lot of fun. But unless they see somebody being successful with it, it might be um, a bit of a challenge. So I would imagine at most schools that there are a few teachers that are technologically inclined and that they might want to start doing it and have them, you know, introduce them to some of the ideas um, that we talked about here or any other things and see how they can or see what they do with it. And then maybe at faculty meetings, have them share um, just to show the other people that it, it's something that's totally doable and that they shouldn't be afraid of. Good for you. Finding those ambassadors in your schools, at your school sites, that's a great, that's a great suggestion. Kelly, can you chime in on this as well? Sure. Um, there's definitely, like Chris said, a few of us here at my school that are a little more inclined to think this stuff is cool. I guess we're the nerds. But um, we, I would suggest doing a lot of hands-on stuff if you can. If you, if you can get the funding to buy one, a kit, one Sphero, one Little Bits kit, something, and then bring that to a faculty meeting or some downtime um, planning periods and have the teachers be able to make those hands-on connections and realize how awesome it is. Um, and then they can see how great that would be for the students as well. Great, thank you. Um, Liza, I hope, I hope I'm not putting you on the spot here, but with your experience and, and the history that you've got working with educators, um, do you have some suggestions on, on how to secure some buy-in? Absolutely. Um, in my experience, if you can get if you can get educators and students in a room, get other teachers from your school in a room and watch them, have them observe the students playing and engaging with the tools, that is your number one. I, in my in my history, that's been the number one way that I that I get buy-in from other teachers. When they see the that engagement, when they see the fun, when they see the curiosity, yeah. I like that. That's an excellent suggestion. Um, another attendee uh, noticed that you know a lot of Chris's uh, suggestions those were about after school type things, and so they're looking for some ideas uh, for bringing these these types of activities into the classroom. You know, and she's looking for ideas for classroom curriculum in which students have to take the course rather than something of a self-selecting club. Um, what kind of suggestions? do you guys have for this, for stuff that they can do in the classroom? And Kelly, let's have you start off with this one. Okay, yeah, great. Um, as of now, I'm doing most of these things in my room, but I think it would be just as easy for the science teacher to um, incorporate like the Faces of Matter Sphero. Like if she had those tools, she would have, plenty, she could just replace, instead of making a diagram, they could code it. Um, so I think it's a matter of just um, having the ideas. Maybe if you, if they need to be given the ideas of things they can do, then then you could be the responsible one to give them those ideas to start. But um, I think it's just a matter of making things relevant enough to the curriculum. And then these are just tools, just like writing a paper. It's uh, 
kind of the same for me. So. I like that. Chris? Yes. Um, so as far as you can bring it into the classroom, coding, uh, so an example, actually just very recently, my seventh graders are working on a unit on probability. So we use Scratch to code different probability simulators. Um, another idea would be um, like code games, uh, code games that teach math is a project I did. Um, I think as far as like if you have a classroom where projects, project-based learning happens a lot, um, coding can just be another uh, medium that the projects can take form as. Um, so a lot of the stuff I talked about is pretty intensive and it needs to be after school. But as far as like scratch, that can be used pretty much in any subject. Just think creatively about the way that you could apply that tool um, to the given subject matter. That's great. Um, and let's stay on that theme here for a second with the with the classroom. Um, one of the other our other attendees has asked how much teacher supervision is required uh, for these types of programs. And Chris Lighton, since you're already here, why don't you go ahead and, and, and talk, and then Kelly, you could follow him. Um, so I'm assuming the question means like teacher supervision of students? Yeah. So um, yes. I would say that there, there definitely needs to be, uh, when the students are first learning, um, the teacher will need to be a little more hands-on as students get more knowledge within the program. Um, teachers can start to step back and say, let's be creative about it. But if it's your student's first time using any one of the, the coding things we've talked about, um, you, you, sh you should expect that there's going to be a lot of troubleshooting that needs to happen. Um, but with each given progression, like the students get more and more independent with it um, and are able to do more projects independently. But I definitely wouldn't just like throw it out there and say, like, look, let's go use Scratch to code stuff if they've never used Scratch before. Um, so at the beginning, um, I would say a good amount, but then less and less as you go. Great. Uh, yeah, I agree with that. Um, also, I find it easy. I, I always make sure if I'm introducing something that I'm putting them in pairs at least so that they can bounce ideas off each other as well. That helps. That's a smart idea. Um, we've got, we're getting low on time, but I don't want to miss some of these great questions that we have. We've got someone who wants to know, how well do these activities work with English as a second language? How well do these activities work with ESL students? Do either of you have, uh, have experience working with that population? Um, personally, I do not. Um, I would say many of the language are very visual. Um, there's not a lot of text, but um, there is text in some of it, but a lot of it is visual so that um, students of all levels can access it. That's great. Kelly, do you have some insight here? And then Liza, I'd, like, I'd love to get your input if you can. Yeah, I also um, don't, but I agree with Chris. Um, a lot of them, um, especially like Kibo, um, if you have younger students like K through two, that's very much, there's pictures and everything, so, and simple words. Um, so I think that would be a good one. Perfect. Liza. Yeah, um, I think when it comes to working with ESL populations, it's, you know, with, with little bits specifically, I, I can definitely speak to that. Um, the, the interface, the physical interface that we have of the bits is we've designed it to be very intuitive. Um, so you're just snapping things around. You can tinker with it um, until you get an idea of how the system works, right? Because all of these tools are just systems, design systems. So uh, likewise with Scratch, it's sort of giving uh, giving the space to tinker. And again, like with, with these other tools that were mentioned, the language is fairly simple. Um, but I think it's giving that time for exploration um, and just uh, more scaffolding. Excellent. Um, I hate to say it, folks, and we've still got some more questions, and I know we didn't get to those, but we are almost out of time here, and I need to wrap it up. But um, if we didn't get to your question, please don't worry. Our sponsor will reach out and, and uh, make contact so that we can get you answers to those things. Um, but I need to say a very quick thanks to Kelly, Chris, and Liza for an exceptional presentation. I got lots of, of interesting ideas from all of this, and I know all of our attendees appreciate you sharing all of this wonderful information. Um, and thank you also to LittleBits, the folks over there who made it possible for us to bring this, inter this interesting content to all of you. Um, as a reminder, folks, everyone's going to receive an email in the next day or two with a link to the archived version of this session. 
We invite you to view it again later and pass it along to your colleagues. And with that, folks, we appreciate you attending. This concludes today's webcast.